Well, hey there. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to the channel for this installment of Open Mic, the show here on the channel where the mic is open, the floor is yours. What topics, what issues, what questions do you have that you want us to discuss here today? That is what we are here to do. I'm, of course, your host, uh, John Campia, and it's an awesome honor and privilege, as always, to have you guys here joining me for this uh, little show. And uh, yeah, it's Halloween. I, I still have the jersey on. But I took off the uh, the eyebrows and the beard. <laughs> it's got to be a little bit uncomfortable. I am, yeah, as you guys know, I am uh, dressing every day in one Halloween costume. Yesterday was Peacemaker. Today is one of my favorite podcasters, and he's also an NFL legend, uh, Jason Kelsey of the Philadelphia Eagles. So, uh, and yes, Travis Kelsey's brother. Uh, so I was dressed up as him today. Still got the jersey, but I ditched the eyebrows and the beard. I hope you guys will forgive me for that though. So it's good to have you guys here joining me. And uh, we didn't have Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan has the day off today. And so we had to do the show from in my office here. That was, haven't done that in a while. Uh, I mean, I did it once a while ago with uh, Chris and I did it today with Rob. So that was, that was interesting. I used to do the show every day like this, where I would run all the technical stuff and try to host the show at the same time. Yeah. It's not, it's not as, not as easy as you might think. <laughs> to do that, at least to do it with any sort of, you know, uh, with any sort of skill, it's, it's a little challenging. It was, but we got through the show today. Nice to have you guys here. And, uh, listen, we have two different ways that you can send in a question or a topic. One way to send in a question or topic is if any of the 24 hours a day that we are not streaming live, you can use our tip link at streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip and send one in there. Or if you are watching live right now, you can use the super chat feature in the live chat. And if your question or comment is appropriate to be used on the show, we will address it here on open mic. All right. As we often do, we're going to start things off here with a, a little side topic that kind of came to my attention. You know, it's kind of a well-known thing in fan circles that at one point they looked at Tom Cruise to be Iron Man. Now, Tom Cruise was never going to be Iron Man in John Favreau's Iron Man. But back in the mid 1990s, Fox, because remember Disney and Marvel was not owned by Disney. They didn't have their own stuff going yet, but Fox was going to be doing an Iron Man movie. And I believe Kevin Feige was attached to be an executive producer of that. And at the time, back in the mid nineties, back when Tom Cruise was a mere 34, 35 years old, uh, they were looking at him as doing, uh, as being Iron Man. But as we all know, it never came to be. As a matter of fact, when Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was coming out, um, there were a lot of, there were some reports going around that Tom Cruise was going to appear in the movie as Iron Man as a, you know, from the, that other earth. And then when he didn't, the report said that they cut him out of the movie, which come on, we all knew that was stupid. If you, if you actually had Tom Cruise be there to be in your movie, they would not have cut Tom Cruise out. And now the, the director and the writers of the movie have, have confirmed that no, Tom Cruise was never going to be in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. But it still leaves us with the question, why didn't that Iron Man movie get made? And why didn't Tom Cruise ultimately end up being that guy? Now, you guys know we've been talking a lot the last couple of days and probably will be for a few more days. There's a new book out called MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios. And there's a lot of information in that book that's been coming out. But one of the things that's in that book is they touch on whatever happened with the Tom Cruise being Tony Stark and Iron Man. Now, this comes to us from the folks at Comic Book Movie quoting that particular book. And uh, this is uh, what it says. So it says, in the um, newly released MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, it's explained that then 44-year-old, 34-year-old, I should say, Tom Cruise, flirted with the idea of playing Tony Stark. We've never really been given an explanation for why it didn't pan out beyond the project being ahead of its time in terms of the VFX required to bring Iron Man to life. However... Kevin Feige reportedly told the authors of the book that, quote unquote, Cruz's asking fee at the time was more than even a profitable studio like Fox was willing to risk on an untested superhero property. That Tom Cruz's asking fee 
was at the time far more than even a profitable studio like Fox was willing to risk on an untested superhero property. Now, this is why, to me, this is so interesting. Because I've already seen some commentary online about untested, like Iron Man's like one of the most popular things in movies. And how could you not take a financial risk on a comic book movie? Guys, a lot of people forget that it wasn't that long ago that comic book movies were a joke. They didn't really make any money. They were never any good. I mean, obviously you had Christopher or Christopher Reeve's Superman. You had a few exceptions, yes. But, you know, that and Iron Man was a B-level comic book hero that a lot of people didn't even really know about other than being familiar with the name Iron Man. He, he was basically what I used to call him was a poor man's Bruce Wayne. Oh, a, a super mega rich industrialist who doesn't actually have superpowers of his own, but he uses his money to create all these gadgets and gadgets and toys and fights crime that way. It, at the time, a lot of people, including me, admittedly, kind of thought Iron Man was like a poor man's Bruce Wayne, right? And at the time, mid nineties, we're going back almost 30 years here, like 25 plus years. Taking a big financial risk on a comic book property was not considered to be a wise move. Now, of course, we live in an era where even a bomb of a comic book movie, like the Marvels is coming out, right? It's saying it's projected to make between 75 and $80 million opening weekend. We live in an era where we consider that a flop. It, making 75 to $80 million opening weekend, but that's the era we live in. That seems like small potatoes compared to what the comic book genre does. But back in the 90s, it was not that way. It wasn't that way. It was different. And Iron Man who is like one of the considered the most one of the most bankable characters today. I mean, Iron Man and Captain America were the two faces, the beating heartbeat of the MCU, the biggest movie franchise in history. It's hard to imagine, but yes, at the time Iron Man was a who? What? Guys, it wasn't until that Iron Man trailer dropped at Comic-Con that anybody took that movie really seriously other than John Favreau himself. There were people who were kind of interested, like, really, Robert Downey Jr. is making a second comeback. Someone, a studio's given Robert Downey Jr. a chance, huh? Okay, let's see how this works out. I mean, there was some interest in the story, but until that Comic-Con trailer dropped, there weren't a lot of people taking the Iron Man movie super seriously. They just weren't doing it. And so today, to find out that, yeah, the reasons for passing on it was Tom Cruise's paycheck size was hefty. And number two, comic book movies were not a dominant force of the box office. And number three, even for comic book movies, Iron Man is an untested kind of quantity. Like we don't really know, or, or, or um, um, I don't like, we don't really know if audiences are going to respond to that character. It may sound shocking to say, but I get why 20th Century Fox at the time passed on it. I get it. I probably, if I was an executive at the time, I probably would have too. But how would have history been different if Tom Cruise had actually ended up playing Tony Stark? I don't believe in the 90s they were ready to make a cinematic universe, right? But I wonder, time is a funny thing. I wonder if this movie actually got made if Tom Cruise had actually played Tony Stark back in the mid nineties, if one of the repercussions of that would have been no MCU would have, would have ever existed that the MCU would never have come to be John Favreau's Iron Man probably certainly wouldn't have happened. And that's really what kicked off the Marvel cinematic universe. I mean, who knows which way history would have gone but it's, it's kind of interesting to think about it that way. And you know what? At the end of the day, would I have been interested to see what a Tom Cruise, Tony Stark would have been? Yeah, of course I would have been interested to see that. But when it's all said and done, I think history played out the way it absolutely should have played out. They didn't make the movie for about another 10 years. 
Robert Downey Jr., who was, for all intents and purposes, a disgraced actor who had twice kind of lost his career, was given another chance. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the most successful financially, you know, series of films in history came to pass. So a shame that Tom Cruise never played Iron Man? Sure. But would we change it? No, probably not. I think everything played out just the way it was supposed to. All right, guys, with that down, let's get to the real reason why we're all here, shall we? Which is to take your comments and questions. And we're going to start things off here with the questions sent in to our tip link. And we're going to start off here with just say or just Jay who writes, Hey, John, I've decided to start making my own content. Congratulations on that. Um, my question is, what is the best news outlet for the earliest news? Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to piggyback off your videos. Well, the, I mean, I myself, I use um, an online service called Feedly. I believe it's run by Google. And it's, uh, it's for all intents and purposes, it's an RSS feed reader. And I subscribe to about 20 to 23 news sources. Now, of course, at the top of my list are the major outlets. Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, The Wrap. Um, then, you know, under that, some of the sites I really trust a lot, Joe Blow, Coming Soon, um, and then a bunch of others, some notable ones like Screen Rant and a bunch of, but I have about 20, 21, 22, 23 news sources that I subscribe to. And that way I always just have to go to my Feedly page and it tells me all the articles that have been released on all those outlets. And that's how I get my news. And again, I, I, I kind of rate it in terms of reliability again, right at the top variety, Hollywood reporter outlets like that. Then you get into the bigger sites like coming soon, Joe blow, and then you get into some others and whatever, but yeah, that's where I get mine. And that's where you should probably get yours. All right. Thanks for sending that in Jay. All right. Next up, we got Brian O'Connor who writes, if Kevin Feige faced challenges in managing the MCU during the Bob Chapek era, it raises questions about his ability to handle the chairman slash COO position uh, held by Alan Horn. No, it does not. It does not at all. Uh, like to hear your thoughts if you still believe Kevin can take that spot at Disney. I do, uh, but you're completely wrong. Uh, listen, even Alan Horn had a boss. Alan Horn was only able, like maybe arguably the greatest movie executive in the history of, of Hollywood is Alan Horn. Alan Horn, though, was only able to do his job and the best it's ever been done because his boss, Bob Iger, um, knew to let Alan Horn do his thing. He let, he empowered Alan Horn, right? He gave Alan Horn the ability to make the decisions that Alan Horn was to make. He knew when to step in when appropriate, Bob Iger did, and he knew when to just let Alan Horn run the show. Following that up, Alan Horn was Kevin Feige's boss. And the reason Kevin Feige, besides being a genius, the reason, the other reason Kevin Feige was able to be so successful is because Alan Horn, his boss, empowered Kevin Feige to do his thing. Now, once Bob Chapek became CEO of Disney, one of the first things that Bob Chapek did was he stripped Kevin Feige's authority away. He took away a lot of Kevin Feige's power and gave a bunch of that power to new middle management that was some of his banker buddies. And that led to a lot of problems at Disney. You guys, for, for those of you who've been around long enough, like when the, the whole turnover happened, I was optimistic when Bob Chapek became CEO. But the day they announced that restructuring, you guys remember what I said. I said, this is going to be disastrous. I was all for Bob Chapek until they announced the restructuring of, of authority and leadership. And I said, this is going to be a disaster. This is going to be disastrous. They're adding new levels of middle management. They're taking power away from the creatives. When it came to Kevin Feige specifically, they took away a lot of Kevin Feige's authority and all that kind of stuff. Now, today, that had no reflection of what Kevin Feige, how he would be able to handle his job if he was in, 
you know, as a chief creative officer, if he was like chairman of Disney pictures, Alan Horn's old position at all. But even if he's in that position, if he has an incompetent CEO above him, it's going to make doing the job very difficult. Alan Horn himself, the greatest movie executive in history, would not have been able to stop the problems that Bob Chapek's reorganization caused. So, no, like the struggles that Kevin Feige had under Bob Chapek in no way call into question what type of a job he'd be able to do in Alan Horn's old job if they have a competent CEO at the top. If you don't have a competent CEO at the top, it's going to make everybody else doing their job very, very difficult. And uh, yeah, so that's just kind of how I see that. All right. Thanks for that, Brian. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, someone asked a question about where the Taylor Swift Eras Tour movie might be carried on streaming. Also uh, about it as a documentary. Well, Taylor already has a 2020 documentary on Disney Plus for the making of her album Folklore. Oh, I never heard of that. Uh, not the same marketing. Is there a part two or is that just it? Not the same marketing. That's interesting. I mean, it doesn't answer the question about where the Eras tour will eventually end up on streaming. I mean, I suppose Disney plus is a possibility that it could end up there, but I don't think I, I, my guess is it won't end up on Disney plus. I mean, it very well could Taylor Swift's brand is very, has a, has a synergy with the Disney brand. I suppose I, I kind of, I'm guessing it's going to end up on like Peacock or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I'm just guessing, but it's, Good information to have. Thanks a lot for that, Garden Variety. All right, next up, Swanson Burgundy, <laughs> two of my favorite characters from the small and the big screen. All right, talks of movie theater staff unionizing has me intrigued. I'll no longer go watch a movie at a theater because audiences act like assholes now. That's unfortunate. Uh, it's a leap, but if staff conditions are better, it could be a step in keeping audiences in check in the future. Listen, uh, first of all, first thing I want to mention is that I have to say this every time somebody brings this up, but I don't know if I'm just lucky, but I have literally had two really bad audience experiences, maybe in the last 10 years that I've been going to the movies. Yeah, like every once in a while, okay, there's a baby crime, but that didn't ruin the movie. Yeah, maybe once in a while there's, uh, I could hear some guy in the back talking to somebody once in a while during the movie, but it wasn't all that bad. Like I, I've honestly myself not had like truly horrible experiences very often, like maybe one every couple of years. So I'm sorry you've had some bad experiences and all that kind of stuff. But um, one of the things that I really think, they used to do this at the Arclight Theater in Hollywood, which no longer exists. But at the Arclight Theater in Hollywood, I never had a problem in there. And I think one of the reasons why is because at the beginning of each movie, before the movie started, an actual staff person came into the movie theater, stood at the front, said, welcome everybody to Arclight. We appreciate you coming. Tonight's movie is, I don't know, I'm going to make one up like Iron Man. Tonight's movie is Iron Man starring Robert Downey Jr. It times in at uh, 147 minutes. We're going to show you three trailers. Arclight Theater only ever showed three trailers. That was it. Three trailers, then start the movie. It was a great rule, but we're going to show you three trailers, start the movie. We do ask that you guys, please, Refrain from using your cell phones. Keep them put away in your pockets. Please do not talk to your neighbors. If you must, make sure it's a whisper. Don't take away from the enjoyment of everybody else. And for that said, on with the show. And everybody would applaud. And I think just that one little thing of an actual physical staff person coming into the theater, welcome everybody, and making a personal request. Guys, please behave yourselves while you're watching the movie. Don't ruin the experience for other people. I think that went a long way. And maybe if they have better staff situations in movie theaters, maybe that would be uh, maybe that would be a good thing. All right. Thanks for uh, bringing that up, Swanson. Next up, we've got Suthius who writes at the branch timeline, Chicago Fair. I assume you're talking about Loki. Uh, they show quite a few international flags in the background. For fun, I thought I'd do some research on the actual flags of that time. And sure enough, there are a few that are slightly different. Very cool detailing. I never even thought of that. But you know what? You're right. I appreciate that when attention to little details like that, like, okay, there's some international flags, but in that year, the flag 
is a li- was a little bit different than what it is today. And the fact that they, I mean, I didn't notice it myself, but the, the fact that they went to that level of detail, that's little things like that I appreciate. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Thanks, man. All right. Next up, we get to uh, David Browser or Bow- Bowers, who says, uh, well, I was quietly not really enjoying Gen V. Oh, that's too bad. I love the show. Uh, and found it a cheap imitation of the boys with less interesting characters. Well, listen, Dave, I completely disagree with your assessment, but that's the beautiful thing about the art is that it all hits us in different ways. Um, Because I think the show is fucking fantastic, but that's just me. All right, uh, with less interesting characters. No complaints, though, as it's only a spinoff. Well, that's until the showrunner confirmed it's essential viewing for boys season four. Grr. I don't know that that they said that it's essential viewing for season four. I think what they mentioned was that the season, the ending of Gen V will lead into the boys season four. But I think if you didn't watch Gen V, I think at the beginning, I'm guessing here, but I feel pretty confident in this guess that at the beginning of season four, they'll probably do like a little previously and they'll, catch up the audience so they know what they need to know. Like, I I really don't think that you're going to be completely lost watching the boys season four, unless you watch Gen V. I I don't think they're going to do that. So I, so if you want to bail on Gen V, which I cannot imagine why to me, it's the best show currently airing on TV. But if you want to bail on Gen V, I honestly think you're probably safe to do so. I, at least that's my guess. I think you'll be safe. All right. Thanks a lot for sharing, Dave. Next up. We've got uh, Duck Duck who writes, Buenas tardes. I love The Force Awakens. I love The Force Awakens too. Anyway, it's basically A New Hope, but honestly like it more. Well, I don't like it more than A New Hope, but um, uh, I think a new cast, I think the new cast has more potential. I like Han more than ever. And Kylo Ren has jumped to my top five Star Wars characters. Is there a part two? We'll come back to Anonymous. Yes. I mean, a stormtrooper turned good, right? I loved that concept. Genius. Ray is uh, Ray is just look, you probably mean Luke, with more spunk. And there are obvious improvements that come with new technology. It's just a better episode for Sumi, but I hope they don't play the rest as safe as this movie. Yeah, I mean, listen, as somebody myself who really loved the first of the new movies, uh, like I, I tell you guys this all the time, John Schnepp and I, like every day, almost every day for a couple of weeks in the afternoon when we had a break, we would run across the street to the movie theater and go watch Star Wars The Force Awakens again. We loved it. We thought it was great. I don't think it's as good as the original trilogy, but we thought it was great. And there are a number of great things, but as somebody who loved The Force Awakens, I, I agree with your assessment that they really did play it safe. I mean, they played it quite safe. They did. Um, I think, I think one of the reasons though, that they played it safe was because, I mean, the prequels were such a train wreck, like the prequels nearly destroyed star Wars. And anybody who disagrees with that probably is too young to remember when they came out. Cause I remember the backlash. I remember the anger and I remember the whole George Lucas ruined my childhoods. Like I, I, I like you just weren't there. If, if, if you don't understand that, then it's because you weren't there. So I think that's probably what, why they made the decision to kind of play it more safe and make it feel more familiar, all that kind of stuff. But I, I agree. I thought they did some really, really interesting things. Um, now, unfortunately for me, maybe not for everybody, but for me, the sequels after the force awakens, went on a downward trajectory until they ended up in the truly God awful, the rise of Skywalker. Um, but yeah, I, I loved the first one. I really did. I thought it was great. All right. Next up, an anonymous viewer writes, by the way, guys, uh, when you, if you use the tip link and send in a question that way, there is a field for you to put in your name. If you don't put in your name, it'll just come up as anonymous. And that doesn't matter to me, but if you're going to support our channel and send in a fun question for us, I just want to make sure you get a shout out. So keep a close, pay close attention to make sure you fill in your name in that field. So you get, uh, you get a shout out. Anyway, that said, uh, anonymous writes, I highly recommend 
Cobweb. It's a great Halloween movie with an absurd number of pumpkins throughout. Uh, plus, there are great creepy performances from Lizzie Kaplan and Homelander himself, Anthony Starr. Uh, don't let Rob spoil it for you. I have never heard of Cobweb. I have never heard of Cobweb. Um, yeah, can't, I, 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 but I love Lizzie Kaplan. Oh, I love Lizzie Kaplan. How many of you guys remember her from hot tub time machine? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Lizzie Kaplan and everything, but I really fell in love with Lizzie Kaplan in hot tub time machine. And Anthony Starr, of course is great, but I will, I will keep my eyes open for, uh, what's it called? I will keep my eyes open for cobweb. I will definitely do that. All right. Uh, Let's take another one. Next up comes to us from, oh, we already did Duck Duck. Okay, Kristen writes, Hey, John and crew. Yesterday was my husband Adam's birthday, and today is our second wedding anniversary. Well, happy anniversary. Oh, I know who this is. I know who this is. Okay. I'll tell you a story in a second, but let me get through this. Kristen wrote, Hi, John and crew. Yesterday was my husband's Adam birthday, and today is our second wedding anniversary. Well, happy anniversary to both of you guys. Uh, we're huge fans of the show. We're hoping to get our own channel to launch soon. Good luck with that. We hope you'll tune in. Uh, much love and keep bringing the filthy. Well, thank you so much for that, Kristen. Okay. Uh, I, I know who this is, and I doubt Kristen is here right now. So I got a comment because I read all the comments. Uh, I, I certainly, I don't have time to reply to all the comments, but I read all the comments, right? At least I usually read all. I try to read as many as I can. So I was reading through the comments today from today's John Campia Show podcast. And I came across one from Kristen. And bless her heart, Kristen was very angry. Very angry in the comment. Drama. And, and was quite snarky to me as well, quite snarky and said, John. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm jabbing you here, Kristen out of love. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm just poking the bear here. Okay. Said, John, I sent in, um, uh, I sent in a, 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 a comment question. What I can't remember exactly said, wanting you to shout out my husband's birthday and our anniversary and you never read it. And what like it was seven, the reason I know this was this was Kristen is because the dollar amount is is seven dollars because and the comment Kristen was was seven dollars not enough for you to and I'm like I read that comment and I was like oh okay let me go and look through the logs I I opened up YouTube I go into the logs and I look for any seven dollar super chat from Kristen because this was during the John Campus show right. And I'm reading through and I'm like, I, there's nothing in the logs from a Kristen, nothing in there. And I'm like, oh, well, I feel bad. Well, now I know Kristen sent it in to the tip link. Look, most of you guys know this. Actually, almost all of you know this, but just, just so you know, and to be clear, the, the questions sent into the tip links get addressed here on open mic. They're not addressed on the John Campia show. The John Campia show, we take questions from our channel members and from some questions of people who want to send in super chats, but we exclusively answer the tip link questions here on open mic. That's what they're for. They're for open mic. And that's why we're here. So Kristen, if you do see this, uh, your question was not ignored. You just did not send it into the right place. Um, so it, you sent it into the tip link and that's addressed here on open mic. So again, happy birthday to your husband. That's great. And happy anniversary to you both. And I'm sorry you felt that we were ignoring you. We were not. You just sent it into the place where it gets answered on open mic. So there you go. All right, let's keep going here. Next up. Uh, we've got another anonymous viewer who writes in when you talked about how, how stars have terms in their contracts about their placement on movie posters. My biggest movie poster pet peeve is when it comes to, when it comes to movies is that our two handers that are two handers and poster has the two stars on the opposite sides of their names. Do you mean two headliners? Okay. I know what you're talking about. So sometimes you get a movie poster and it's like, I don't know, John Travolta and Denzel Washington, but it'll have John Travolta's name above Denzel Washington and Denzel Washington's name above John Travolta. You know, Quentin Tarantino actually did a play on that 
in the opening credits of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, because he specifically, I th I think it was, uh, Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio were in the car together, but he purposely put the other person's name, so that he put Brad Pitt's name under, um, Leonardo DiCaprio and Leonardo DiCaprio's name under Brad Pitt. So yeah, I mean it, it is a a little annoying. It's it's not a big deal, but I, I must admit, whenever I do notice it, it makes me scratch my head a little bit too, Anonymous. All right. Uh, Quinn Fowley writes, uh, on the day I'm writing this, October 23rd, Weird Al is somewhere out there celebrating his 64th birthday. Of course, today is the 24th. Uh, makes me wonder, John, do you have any favorite Weird Al songs that are not parodies, but original work? Yes. And of course, Weird Al is one of my favorite celebrities. I recently got, uh, if you guys didn't know this, I recently got to uh, fulfill a bit of a dream. I got to meet Weird Al. Now, I've met almost everybody in the Hollywood business. I've been very lucky that way because of the job that I have and stuff like that. The one, I mean, I have walked up to Harrison Ford, one of the most intimidating guys in Hollywood. I've walked up to Harrison Ford, introduced myself, talked to him. I've sat in George Lucas's office. I have gone up and spoken to, you know, you, you name it. I, I've, I've done it right. But we I grew up on Weird Al's music and at least four times I've been at a, an event that he's been at too. And I've always been too afraid to go up and say hi to him. So last year, or maybe it was this year, I can't remember, but a while ago, um, Weird Al was on tour and Ann got us tickets and Ann got us a VIP package for a backstage meet and greet after the concert. And I was so excited. I was so excited. I can't even begin to tell you how excited I was. I was going to finally get to meet Weird Al. I, I mean, one time I was literally going to an after party and Weird Al was on the escalator on the step in front of me. And Anne's like, say hi to him, say hi to him. I'm like, no, 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 I can't, I can't, no, I can't. And, and so I never even met him before. So I was finally going to meet him. And so we go to the Weird Al concert, had a great time at the concert. And then we go to the VIP area to go get ready to do the meet and greet. And we're in line waiting to go up and, you know, meet him and have him autograph something. And when it comes to my turn, and this is one of the, I know this sounds pathetic, but it's one of the greatest moments of my life. I start walking up towards Weird Al and Weird Al turns his head and sees me and goes, John. <laughs> And Anne started to cry because Anne knew how, how big that was to me. Anne knew exactly how big that was to me. And so Anne started crying <laughs> when, when Weird Al looked at me and goes, John. And I, if I wasn't trying to play it so cool, I'm like, hey, Al, man, so excited to meet you. But inside I'm like, <laughs> like, I, like I was completely school girling out, right? Like I was completely, I had no composure whatsoever. And I know saying meeting Weird Al is one of the greatest moments of my life does not make it sound like your life was so great. I get it. I understand. It's a little bit sad. But that was one of the greatest moments of my life <laughs> was when Weird Al looked at me and said, John, it was the greatest thing ever. Anyway, back to your question. Well, uh, some of my favorite, do I have a favorite song of Weird Al that is not a parody song? He's actually got a couple of songs that I love, like absolutely love. Um, one of them is like an old one. I think this goes back to his eat it days. Like it's an old, old, old one, but it's called midnight star. It's a song about rag magazines, like the national Enquirer. like, Oh, midnight star, um, aliens from outer space are sleeping in my car. Midnight star. I want to know. I want to know. The ghost of Elvis is living in my den. Anyway, it's it's a great song. It's really, really fun. It's called Midnight Star. But my I think my favorite original song of his, and I want to I, I'm not sure if I got the title right. I could sing you the song, but it's called Um You're Not Perfect, but You're Good Enough for Now. <laughs> it's a love song whose whose chorus goes, You're not perfect, but you're good enough for now. 
I, I love that song. It's fantastic. Yeah, Weird Al's got some really, really good originals. He really does. If you haven't checked it out, uh, any of his stuff out, I, I highly recommend you check out some of his originals. All right, next up, uh, we're going to go to Stubble McShave, who writes, I think there will be more big live action movies moving from the summer of 2024 because of the strike. Uh, Mission Impossible 8 is just one of the early ones to move. Do you think there won't be any big live action movies released this upcoming summer? No, I, I don't I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be many. I think I think there are a number of the bigger summer of 2024 movies were probably already done physical production by the time the actor strike hit. There are going to be a couple like Mission Impossible 8 that had not, you know, finished their physical production, physical shooting. But I think a lot of the movies probably did and are in big, long post-production processes right now. So will there be more than Mission Impossible 8? Probably, but I don't think it's going to be the majority of them. We'll have to wait and see, but I think probably a good number of them had already done shooting. And then, are, and then like I said, are now in the long post-production uh, stage of things. All right, guys, we're going to move over and start taking questions now from you guys who are watching live and have been sending in super chats. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, but before we get to those questions, those guys, we're going to take a second and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode. Our friends, I love these guys at Masterclass and the makers of the most comfortable shoes I have ever worn in my life, Vessi. We want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of this video, Masterclass. Guys, you know, as a small business owner, I am finding myself having to be in negotiations all the time, whether it's with new contractors, vendors, or even agencies that represent our company. Now, I don't like to go into these negotiations unarmed, so I found the perfect class on Masterclass, The Art of Negotiation by Chris Voss, a real-life former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Taking this class on Masterclass made me feel a lot more equipped and confident going into all these various negotiations. I have to do on a regular basis. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. An annual membership starts at just $10 a month, and you get unlimited access to every instructor, thousands of online lessons, exclusive content, insight, and much more. There are over 180 classes to pick from, everything from filmmaking with Martin Scorsese all the way to cooking with the great Gordon Ramsay. In Masterclass, you will find practical lessons that you can apply to your life and work. So guys, get unlimited access to every class. And right now, as a John Campy Show listener, you can get 15% off when you go to masterclass.com slash campia. That's masterclass.com slash campia for 15% off an annual membership. Masterclass.com slash campia. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Vessi. Now, you guys know I'm not exactly the most fashion conscious guy in the world, but I love a great pair of shoes that are comfortable and I can wear almost anywhere. And growing up in Canadian winters when my feet got wet a lot, waterproof would be nice too. Enter Vessi. They make the claim that they're not just fashionable and super comfortable, they're also waterproof. Now, you guys remember, when I got my first pair of Vessis, I put them to the ultimate waterproof test. I actually stuck my foot in my pool, my feet stayed dry, and the shoes stayed dry. Incredible. And they're the most comfortable pair of shoes I ever owned. Well, that made me want another pair. So I got another pair of Vessis that look great and just equal that world-class comfort that I got from that first pair shoes. They are absolutely my favorite shoes that I've ever owned. Imagine your favorite sneaker style supercharged with waterproof technology and unmatched comfort. No matter how you like to stay active, Vessi has the shoes for you. Trail-ready high tops, effortless slip-ons, and classic court shoes, all with a waterproof twist. They are just as comfortable and stylish as your favorite sneakers, but even more versatile. So guys, if you're anything like me and you want the most comfortable pair of shoes that look great, that you can take out hiking, wear to work, go to the gym, or walk through the water and snow, go to Vessi.com slash Campia and get yourself a pair today. Go to Vessi.com slash Campia and get 15% off your order using the code Campia. And thank you to our friends at Masterclass and Vessi for sponsoring this episode. All right, guys, let's get on over now and start taking your super chat questions. I, I unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to have it all that well set up that you guys are going to be able to see the questions very well, but I will still read them uh, regardless. Uh, okay, let's get to where are we starting? I think we're starting with Fang Blaze. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, Fangblaze71 writes, I just finished Spider-Man 2, the game, and behind Spider-Verse movies, uh, I think this is my favorite Spider-Man content ever made. It's perfect. I have a hard time believing that. Like, here's the thing. There, I watched the uh, cutscene movie of the first Sony Spider-Man game, and it was really good. It's really good. But like some people say, this is the greatest Spider-Man content ever. I'm like, no, it's not. I mean, we get more engaged with something if we are playing it because we're a part of it. But if you just step back and actually look at the story itself, I mean, it it was good. I mean, I, I thumbs up from me. I like it. But it wasn't like the greatest Spider-Man content ever. I think it would, might feel a little bit more enhanced if you're actually playing the game and you're immersed in it. Like, I bet if I take a step back from Baldur's Gate 3, because right now I think Baldur's Gate 3 is the greatest game of all time, and I think the story is awesome. But maybe I'm like, I'm thinking the story is better than it is because I'm actually in the story. I'm playing the story. I'm actually helping shape the direction of the story. But maybe if I just actually stepped back and took a look at the story from a, a more objective perspective, I wouldn't feel that way. But I'm hearing a lot of people really enjoying that new Spider-Man game, though. All right, next up, Fangblaze also writes, I see a lot of people say Cap Captain Marvel only made a billion because of Endgame hype, but Ant-Man 2 came in between Infinity War and Endgame and made $600 million. Yeah, 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 listen, it's all over the place. People make excuses to suit their own narratives. You might also, you can put this on a tattoo if you want. People make up excuses to make things suit their own personal narratives. Like all these people crying, oh, Captain Marvel's going to flop, Captain Marvel's going to flop, Captain Marvel's going to flop. Captain Marvel makes a billion dollars. Well, well, the only reason I made a billion dollars is because this happened. No, shut up. It made a billion dollars because a billion dollars worth of people wanted to go out and see it. People don't go to see movies they don't want to see. People go see movies they do want to see. And it's, it's just funny watching people scramble to come up with excuses why their favorite movies maybe didn't do so well or why movies they wanted to fail actually succeed and they come up with all these random excuses by the way you notice that all the excuses they always come up with are completely unprovable right like there's there's no way to prove what they're saying is true and that's that's uh, that's an obvious sign of people who have a real weak argument is when their main argument is something that you cannot possibly verify <laughs> so yeah, I I mean, listen, I'm not saying people needed to like the Captain Marvel movie. I, I I like the movie, but I think it has its flaws and I could totally see why there are people who didn't like the movie. Totally fair. Nothing wrong with that. I just get a giggle when I see people desperately scurry to make excuses for why something they didn't think should have succeeded did succeed. Now, We'll see what happens with the Marvels. The Marvels is only pacing at about half the opening weekend that the first Captain Marvel did. And I think there's a whole laundry list of reasons why. But yeah, it's one of the things I've always, all the way back to the movie blog days, that I try to tell my fellow film fans, because I catch myself doing it. You've done it. Everybody does it. Don't make excuses for why other people do things differently than you. Like, I'm sorry. A billion dollars worth of people wanted to go see Captain Marvel. And if you didn't, you didn't. It's just that simple. Stop making excuses. All right. Uh, next up here, we got String Bean. Who writes, hey, John, did I miss your review for Killers of the Flower Moon? No. Uh, sorry to make you repeat yourself. If so, I loved it. Great book adaptation in my, opinion, in my opinion. Sadly, it's a terrible but important part of history. Happy Halloween. No, I did not review it because I still haven't seen it. I had my tickets. Some of you who were around last week remember this. I had my tickets for Killers of the Flower Moon on Thursday. Ann and I had our Thursday tickets. But as our schedules worked out, we had to do an open mic that day. And I put work first. And so Ann and I had to skip out. Now, unfortunately, our entire weekend was completely booked. Friday, we were completely booked. Saturday, we were completely booked. And Sunday, I don't go to the movies on Sundays. Sundays is my day off, period. I sit at home, I relax with friends, and I watch football. That's what I do on Sundays. Uh, I used to work on Sundays. I don't do that anymore. Uh, and then Monday, we were completely booked. And now Tuesday, Anne's actually out of town, and she doesn't want me to go see Killers of the Flower Moon without her. She's out of town until tomorrow night. So the earliest we're going to get to see Killers of the Flower Moon 
is Thursday in a double feature with Five Nights at Freddy's, which is crazy because I've been aching to see Killers of the Flower Moon. But and part of the part of the problem is there if the Killers of the Flower Moon was like a two hour movie, there was an opportunity that I might have been able to go see it uh, this past weekend. But because it's like a three and a half hour movie, it didn't fit into the schedule. So I couldn't see it. So, yeah, despite the fact that I've been aching for like six months to see this movie, I haven't seen it yet. So I've not been able to give my own personal thoughts on that, unfortunately. All right. Next up, we go to Casinema writes, have you seen the first look at Omni-Man's gameplay in Mortal Kombat 1? No, don't care. Uh, he looks great and they worked in some great references to the show. I'm sure it's great. I mean, listen, Mortal Kombat has done a lot. I mean, look, it's just a marketing gimmick, right? They've been doing this for a while. They put Terminator in the game. They put Rambo in the game. It's just a skin. I mean, so it is what it is. Listen, I love Omni-Man, but I... I no longer get excited. Like I remember the first, I think it was back when they put Terminator in Mortal Kombat. I remember like, wow, that, and I don't know if it was the first time they did it or not, but it was the first time they put like a big, uh, that I, it was the first time that I recognized that they put a big outside character in Mortal Kombat. And I thought, wow, that's really neat. And we did a story about it, but the novelty of that is kind of worn off on me now. So I don't really care when they say, Oh, they're putting in Urkel in mortal Kombat." Okay. I take it back. You put Urkel in mortal Kombat, Maybe I get interested. Weird Al is now in mortal Kombat. Okay. Maybe I'll be interested then, but, um, yeah. Uh, I, other than that, I don't really see any, any interest in that or why I should be interested in it, whatever it's again, the first time they did it, it was novel. It was kind of neat, but the novelty of that's worn off of me. So it's not really something I, I personally pay much attention to. All right. Uh, next up, um, CR writes, I want to be just like Homelander when I grow up. Well, I'm deciding whether I should say something or let the filter between my brain and my mouth kick in. You know what? I'm going to let the, I'm, I'm going to with, I'm going to not say the joke I was going to say. All right. Robert uh, Presser writes, uh, sick peacemaker costume. Almost couldn't see you. Ah, I guess it's John Cena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yesterday my costume was peacemaker. Uh, all right. Isaac Martinez writes, is there any uh, actor that can beat Killian Murphy for best actor besides Leonardo DiCaprio and Bradley Cooper? I can't, th I can't think of anyone to be honest. Um, yes. Listen, uh, Killian Murphy was great in Oppenheimer. He really was. Was it a Daniel Day Lewis and There Will Be Blood performance where it's like, that's unbeatable? No. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Murphy won't win Best Actor at the Academy Awards. I'm not saying he won't. But it was one of those performances that I would personally definitely nominate. But it's not like one of the top 10 greatest performances of all time where it's like nothing else is going to compete with this. He's vulnerable. He he might, he might could win it, but he could easily lose it out too. And I think there are a number of really strong performances already this year. I don't even know that Bradley Cooper will be one of them. Leonardo DiCaprio always slips into the conversation there. So I, I it's, it's, listen, he'll be nominated but I don't think he's so much a favorite that it's his Academy Award to lose. You know what I mean? I, I think they're, I think he'll be in the running. I just don't know that I call him the definitive odds on favorite for it quite yet, but that's just me. All right. Uh, next up, Ian McAllister writes between Hogwarts legacy, Baldur's gate, Zelda, and now Spider-Man two, this will be the closest game awards ever. My vote is with Hogwarts legacy though. I got to tell you, Listen, I'm not the world's, world's form. I mean, I've been playing video games for longer than probably some of you have been alive, but I'm not the world's, I'm not like one of the world's foremost experts on video games, but I got to tell you, I, I personally think Baldur's Gate three might be the single greatest video game ever made. I like, I, I really do. If for no other reason, like, okay, you're playing Spider-Man and Spider-Man two, there is a definitive narrative path that regardless of what you do in the game, this is the way the game goes right? You'll have a little control here and there, but in Baldur's Gate 3, for any of you who have not played it, every little decision you make, it's it's like in Loki 
at the TVA and seeing multiple timelines sprouting and existing. It's like the game can go in so many different directions depending on what you do and the decisions you make. It's crazy. By the way, Hogwarts Legacy is really wonderful too. I, I mean, I agree with you. It's it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I have not obviously had a chance to play Spider-Man 2 yet. Uh, I did play a little bit of Zelda, but not a ton. But I, I got to say for me, it's this is a great year for video games. Uh, but for me right now, it's it's Baldur's Gate. It's just it's such a different level. It's on such another level. It's it's just I think it's the greatest achievement ever in video games. I really do. But that's just me. I'm sure there'll be many others who know a lot more about video games than I do that would disagree. All right. Uh, next up, we go to Calvin Pano, who sends in like a fifty dollars super chat. Thank you, uh, Calvin, who writes, uh, hey, John, uh, who started filming Oh, sorry. Doctor Who started filming series 15 yesterday. Uh, they already have three 60th birthday specials, the entire series 14 and the two that, by the way, I know nothing about Doctor Who and I don't really care about Doctor Who. So a lot of this is Greek to me. I don't know what it's saying. Um, they already have three 60th birthday specials, the entire series 14 and the 2023 Christmas special in the can. Why can't other big properties keep the same pace? Uh, Stranger Things, Marvel, DC, Star Wars, etc. I mean, listen, I, I don't really know. I mean, take the Doctor Whoism out of it. By the way, no disrespect to Doctor Who. I just don't watch it. I, I just don't know anything about it. But I've always talked about, listen, for decades and decades and decades and decades, a TV show would come out every year and they would have 20 plus episodes a year. And their season would come, it would end, and then like clockwork, the very next year, the next season would start with 20 plus episodes, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 episodes. And there are still some shows that do it that way, right? Since, since for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades and decades and decades, and decades shows were able to do that. Why on earth do you need four years to come out with a seven episode season two? I mean, and listen, I get it. TV shows today are more expensive than ever. Yeah, they are. There's a little bit more complex complexity that goes into certain shows than have gone into others. Absolutely. Completely understand that. But technology has also advanced a hell of a lot since the 1980s and the 1990s and the early 2000s. You have way better t technology. You have way more sophisticated distribution platforms now. You have all these advantages that shows back then never had. And yet they were able to crank out 20 plus episode seasons every year on the year. Now I'm not saying House of the Dragon needs to be 22 episodes every year on the year, but if you're gonna make eight episodes, then have the next season ready next year. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, again, it's just me. Like Vickster in the live chat is pointing out West wing 24 lost all these shows, massive amounts of episodes every year coming out every year on the year, like clockwork, but we have to make seven episodes. It's going to take us four years to make the next seven episodes. Come on, come on. If all these people using with antiquated equipment and technology and all this kind of stuff could do it. Why can't you? I don't think it's unreasonable for me to ask that. All right, listen, guys, we have more questions to get to, but before we do, we're going to take another quick moment here and thank another sponsor of today's episode of open mic, the main sponsors of the John campus show podcast, YouTube channel, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours. Mint mobile guys. We want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video. Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before 
I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for saving me tons of money every month, and they could be saving you tons of money too, and for sponsoring the John Campia Show YouTube channel. All right, guys, with that down, let's get back to your questions here, shall we? We're going to pick things up with uh, Hung Vu, who writes, Hey, John, I had a conversation with a friend about, about true crime contents. Do you think that they are unethical and profiting from the dead? Um, this kind of question comes up every once in a while, whether they're making a movie about 9-11 or they're making a movie about some tragedy. I, I do think they're completely ethical. We tell stories. That's what we as human beings do. We tell stories. We as a species, we're storytellers. And the main source of our stories are stories about things that really happened. I mean, could you make the argument that, oh, the news is reporting about a murder? Is that unethical? Because the news is profiting from reporting on that story. People are going to tune in to hear the news about somebody getting murdered or whatever, right? I mean, I, I don't see it that way. I think stories need to be told. And um, I, I just think that's the nature of what we are as human beings. Now, some people may say, and, and this debate and discussion comes up a lot. And I understand there are different ways of looking at it. I'm only presenting you with the way I look at it because I'm the only one here right now. But like you may say, well, this was something that actually happened to somebody there. It could hurt some people's feelings or it be insensitive to some people. But what I always come back to is this. Do you know how many people have suffered from losing loved ones in car accidents? I think probably everyone you know has lost somebody or know somebody that lost somebody in a car accident, right? Lost a family member, lost a loved one, lost a brother, a sister, a mother, a child in a car accident. Should movies and TV shows not have car accidents? Well, of course they should have that. That's a part of the human experience. It's it's something that happens. It's tragic, it's awful, but it's it's part of the human experience. And And while that may be sensitive to certain people watching because maybe they lost a loved one in a car accident. And this is hurtful to see. I, I understand that, but it's part of the human experience and telling stories of that, whether it's cancer or, or car accidents or a war or a tragic event or a true crime. I, and, and like anything else in life, I don't think there's a black and white answer. I think it comes down to how is it then handled, right? How is the, how is the content is it handled sensitively? Is it handled in a way that glorifies the wrongdoers? Or is it done in such a way that makes light of the tragedy? Or does it honor the people who may have died? Does it highlight the wrong that was done to them? You know, it, it, so there's not a right and wrong black and white issue, but it's, it's, it's about, number one, I think we should in principle be able to tell these stories. But number two, then it becomes about how do you tell them? Do you tell them sensitively? Do you tell them with seriousness? Do you tell them without glorifying the ones who did wrong while being respectful to the ones who were wronged? I mean, it's it all comes down to that. But in general, yes, I think stories, particularly true stories, need to be told. And, and I know there's going to be other people that have different opinions, and that's fine. And maybe I'll have a different opinion in a while, but that's kind of what I think right now. All right, next up. Uh, John Redcorn writes, when will we get a Madam Web trailer? No idea. Um, I have a feeling Madam Web is probably going to be bumped. By the way, Madam Web is one of those movies, and Rob and I were talking about this the other day, that when they first announced it, I'm like, why the hell are they making a Madam Web movie? But then when I started reading about what the story is going to be about, I'm like, Okay, that actually sounds kind of interesting. This, and I think Rob is on the same page with me. Like, this actually sounds like it could be pretty good. But, I mean, there's an actor strike right now. What's the point of starting a marketing campaign when the actors can't be out there talking about it? 
I, I don't know if it affected any production or reshoots or anything like that. So right now, no idea. But listen, at the end of the day, a trailer is just a commercial. So I, I, it doesn't really matter to me when they come out. But I am looking forward to seeing it whenever it does. All right, next up. Robert Presser writes, over under 30%, we get a Nova special. Under 30%, I don't think they're going to go that way. By the way, I think Marvel under Bob Iger is going to probably... I'm not going to say we're never going to see another special, but that's just a, the special. Listen, I loved Werewolf by Night, and I love the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special. It's my all-time favorite Christmas special. But those are money pits. They just cost money to make. They don't make the studio any money. They just lose money. And I don't know if Bob Iger's going to have them do a lot of specials. So I'm going to go under 30%. We get a Nova special, not zero, but I'm going to go under 30% as a guess. All right. Wicked art writes, Hey John, one of my favorite movies of all time is Serenity. I love Serenity. Um, it's hard to believe it's almost 20 years old. Who is your favorite character in the movie? Mine is a tie between Mel and Wash. Keep it shiny. Wash was great. I am a leaf on the wind, uh, played by the great Alan, why am I freezing on Alan's last name? Guys, in the live chat, help me out. What was Alan's last name who played Wash in Serenity? Uh, why, why, why am I freezing on his name? Anyway, Tudyk, thank you. So thank you, Wicked Art, Tudyk. Yeah, love him in it. But listen, the stand, I love Mel. I loved all the characters. I love Serenity. I liked it more than the TV show, Firefly. But... It was the movie Serenity that introduced us to what I think is one of the best actors living today, Chiwetel Ejiofor, who played the operative in one of the greatest sci-fi villains ever. Chiwetel Ejiofor's uh, The Operative is one of the most bone-chilling, um, great villain characters ever. He was fantastic in that. So I would actually, as much as I love Wash and everybody else in it, I think I got to say it was the operative. I, I think it was Chu Taleji for was probably my favorite character uh, in the movie. Oh God, I love Serenity. That movie is so, and you know what the best thing about Serenity is? Even though it's based on, it's a continuation of the Firefly TV series, you never had to have watched Firefly to watch the movie. I actually saw Serenity before I watched Firefly. And I loved it. And then I went back and watched Firefly. And Firefly is great as a, as a one season show. But Serenity, truly something special. If you guys haven't seen Serenity, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's so good. All right, next up. Uh, where are we at here? CG Re CJ Rebirth writes, I'm still hopeful going into the Marvels, mainly because I love Ms. Marvel and I'm excited to see Kamala and her family again. Uh, hashtag still team Bruno. Look, I want to be optimistic about the Marvels. I do. Because I, I, I liked the Captain Marvel movie. I've quite liked the character in the MCU so far, but I love Ms. Marvel and her family. They are just some of the most, to me, some of the most cherished things in the MCU is, is Kamala and her family. I am 80% going to see the Marvels for Ms. Marvel. I want to be optimistic. You know I want to be optimistic. But when you add together a very mediocre ad campaign, which has done nothing to really get me excited... And the fact that the news has come out that they're not lifting the review embargo until the day before the movie comes out. You guys know me. Whenever a movie does that, that screams to me that the studio has no confidence in the movie. Right? They have no confidence in the movie. So it's, it's, I'm trying to hold on to my enthusiasm for it, CJ. I really am. And I, I'll be there opening day. I'll, I'll go opening night, but my expectations have come down a lot. So I don't know. Fingers crossed that it'll still end up being good. I hope it's good. All right. Next up, we got Spencer Smothers who writes, and by the way, I see some people asking, why can't I send in a super chat? I, I've turned off the super chats, guys. We got enough to finish off the show here. So um, Spencer Smothers writes, uh, with subscriptions churning increasing, we talked about that on the John Campy show earlier today. Uh, I think we will see them moving to a week to week release model to keep temporary subscribers subscribed longer. You know what, Smothers? 
That is a really good observation. That is yet another good reason why you're going to see streamers. Well, first of all, a lot of streamers already do the week to week thing, right? And there's a reason for that. If your show is good, like say WandaVision or Mandalorian season one, whatever week you do week by week releases, the audience grows and grows and grows and grows because word gets out, people jump on board and the, it goes up and it gets people talking. I've, I've said this before, but it's, it, I'll bring it up every time. A great example of this, think of WandaVision and Punisher season two. WandaVision had week to week releases. Punisher season two on Netflix got dropped all at once. I was so excited about Punisher season two because I really like season one and Punisher season two is great. I loved it. But Punisher season two dropped. Bunch of people talked about it on our show the first day after it came out and the second day after it came out. But by the third day after it came out, questions and topics about it dropped by more than half. And by the fourth day, nobody was talking about it. From then on out, maybe about once a week for the next couple of weeks, maybe once a week we got a question about or a topic or somebody wanting to bring up something about Punisher season two. It was gone like a fart in the wind. It was just gone. It was good. People liked it. And then nobody talked about it. WandaVision or Mandalorian season one or House of the Dragon or whatever other of these shows, these really good shows that release week to week. But with WandaVision particularly, for two months, everything that everybody talked about for two solid months was WandaVision. WandaVision one of every single day. Wanda, at least half the questions every single day that would come into the John Campus show was about WandaVision. WandaVision theories, WandaVision questions, WandaVision observations, WandaVision opinions. It was WandaVision. It, it became a central piece of the pop cultural conversation for months. On Netflix, drops, disappears. And I think you're right, Spencer. I think as churn increases amongst streaming subscribers, I think you're hundred percent right that at some point, what we're going to see here is like Netflix is going to go, well, um, people are churning a lot. Maybe we should do week to week. So they stay subscribed for longer, you know, instead of subscribing, binge watching a show in three days, unsubscribing. Well, now, you know, you got a 10 episode season of something, you subscribe, you stay subscribed for two and a half months. And then maybe hopefully by then, if you're Netflix, we've got another new thing coming out to keep people. I, I think you're right. I think this is going to encourage people like Netflix or companies like Netflix to switch to a week to week release schedule. All right. CR writes the whole McDonald's sequence in episode two of Loki was awesome. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Listen, I'm really liking Loki season two, which I'm so relieved because I Look, Loki is either my second or third favorite MCU character. And I didn't love Loki season one. I, I didn't hate it. I didn't, I didn't think it was bad. I, I thought it was, I mean, I watched the whole thing. I mildly enjoyed it, but I, it, it was kind of underwhelming. I thought it should have been better. Season two, so far, we just got into it, but so far season two for me is a big step up and I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm glad I am. All right, next up. Duck Duck writes, uh, Buenas tardes. Before I watched Star Wars, even I knew uh, about the divisive The Last Jedi. I'm so excited to see what happens and what caused so much drama. Yeah, and I think, and by the way, The Last Jedi is like Citizen Kane compared to like uh, The Rise of Skywalker. But I think it's, it's a marriage of a couple of things that you're going to find. One is it was a big step down from Force Awakens. But I really think the primary thing for most people, even though I, to me, was the whole casino, you'll see what I mean. The casino planet stuff, everything that had to do with the casino planet, uh, the use of Benicio del Toro, um, like a, a bunch of bad things. But I think for a lot of people, it was revealing what happened to Luke. And because they didn't have Luke do what people in their heads thought Luke should have done. They immediately turned on it. I personally kind of, I listen, I, I, and in all serious, I've had this discussion with people. 
it's okay to like or not like the way they the, the stuff they did with Luke. And there's a lot of different things they could have done with Luke. There are things that I kind of wish they had done with Luke, and that's fine. But I don't go into a movie wanting them to do what I think the characters should do. I want to see what you as the filmmakers are going to have the characters do. That being said, what they did with Luke in that movie, and there's a, a lot of other things they could have done that would have been equally valid, but they went with one particular direction and it's okay to like it and it's okay not to like it. But so many people are going, that's not what Luke would have done. Hey, listen, I'm sorry. If you don't recognize that what they had Luke being and doing and what they said his backstory was in The Last Jedi, then I have to wonder if you know Star Wars at all. Like if you know the original trilogy. Because it's okay to like it or not like it. And there are other things they could have done that also would have been consistent with his character that we knew from the original trilogy. There, there are other directions they could have gone. Yes. But the fact that they went in that direction, if you actually know the original trilogy and you understand his character, what he's been through, the things he has seen and the things he has experienced and what his personality traits have been. If you don't come away going, well, at least I didn't like what he did in The Last Jedi, but what he did is consistent with the character. If you don't come away with that, I got to wonder if you actually know Star Wars. Not saying if you didn't like it, I don't know if you know. It's okay to hate it. It's okay to hate it. I'm just saying it was consistent with the Luke Skywalker we met in the original trilogy. It just was. That doesn't mean it was good. And it doesn't mean they couldn't have done other things that would have been better. But what they did was legitimately consistent with the Luke we knew from the original trilogy. And I'll debate anybody on the planet on that. Anybody on the planet on that. I'll, I'll have that debate. I won't debate that it was good, but I'll debate that it was consistent with his character. So anyway, that's just kind of my take on that. All right, next up. Uh, let's see. Richard uh, Menchaca writes, what are your thoughts on Marvel using the multiverse to bring an older version of Black Panther's son from the future to help fight Kang or whatever the villain the Avengers may have to fight? I don't like it. Um, yeah, I, I don't like the idea. That's been brought up and uh, like that. That's an idea, Richard, that's been floated a lot ever since Black Panther Wakanda Forever was that they'll use some either some kind of time travel or multiverse or something along those lines to have the young uh Prince T'Challa, son of T'Challa, uh, as an, a big grown up now and is now the new Black Panther and blah, blah. I, honestly, I don't like the idea myself. I mean, look, you made the bed of making Shuri the new Black Panther, which made no sense. Having Shuri be the new Black Panther instead of, um, like, look, first of all, the only character, there are two characters that it made sense to be the new Black Panther. Either um, Lupita Nyong'o, right, or Winston Duke. Those are the only two characters that even made logical sense to be the new Black Panther. The fact that they went with Shuri, who had no combat training, absolutely nothing. She was a science head and one of my favorite characters in the MCU, but she was a science head. Meanwhile, you had Nakia, you had Lupita Nyong'o, who is an international warrior who literally single-handedly just infiltrated Atlantis, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Talokan. She just single-handedly found and infiltrated Talokan, took out guards and rescued Shuri and got her out. And Shuri is the one who gets to be Black Panther? What? What? How did that make any sense at all? I mean, or M'Baku, who... I mean, ultimately, M'Baku ends up being king, but M'Baku was by far the superior choice to be Black Panther. I like the Shuri character more than M'Baku. I mean, I love both of those characters, but M'Baku was clearly the choice to be Black Panther if it's not going to be Nakia. 
Right. Anyway. So, but no, I, in general, I don't like the idea of now taking his, uh, T'Challa's son and then doing some kind of time warp and making him the new black. Pan- I, uh, I mean, look, it's Kevin Feige. If they come up with a good way to do it, maybe it'll work. Uh, I'm open to that, it, but in general, I, I don't like the idea. This is me personally. Uh, and then last question of the day, guys, we've gone a little bit over time. That's okay. Last question of the day comes to for, uh, to us from Alec Andrew, who writes, we need Nick Cage to play Trump in a biopic. Well, I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole whatsoever. Uh, anyway, guys, that'll do it for today's installment of open mic. Thank you guys so much for being here and making our little show a part of your day. It's always fun doing these afternoon shows with you guys. Very, very laid back. Very relaxed, a lot more informal. I, I really enjoy doing those uh, these, and I'm glad you guys have been here with me along the way as well. Again, all opinions that I gave on today's show were just opinions that I might even change over the course of time as new things come up and I'm introduced to new ideas and whatever. So if I said something that doesn't jive with what you think, don't get butthurt about it. It's just, we're talking about movies. We're all supposed to have different opinions and thoughts and ideas about this stuff. That's what makes it fun being film fans all together. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for being here. Make sure you come on back and join us again tomorrow for the next installment of the John Campy Show podcast. We're going to be back in the main studio tomorrow. Of course, we did the show from in here in my office today, but Jonathan's back tomorrow. We'll be in the main studio there. Robert will be here again, as he often is on Wednesday. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. So that'll do it for me for now, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.